Give me a sight, O Savior, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. Sir. 
Thank you very much, men. It's wonderful to have the joy of the Lord in our heart and good to be able to sing these old hymns of Zion. And we really appreciate you being here tonight. We're turning to the book of Revelation tonight and we're turning to Revelation chapter, chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 tonight. And we're just going to settle down to the word of the Lord. We had a blessed time this morning around God's word. And thank God for his word. Thank God for this word that is forever uh, settled in heaven. This word that can minister to us and this word that can feed our heart and feed our soul. And that's what we're going to turn to tonight is this precious Word of God. And thank God for that. And I trust that you have your Bible with you tonight. And it's good to bring the old book. Good to be able to turn the pages of the Word of God. Father, we bow before Thee tonight. And we thank You for the prayer that we have heard. We thank You, Lord, for the pieces that our brothers have ministered to us. And we thank You for the Word of God. And we come to Thee now, gracious Father, and we pray for the help of God. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come and move in this gathering tonight. We pray for that authority, that anointing that breaks the yoke. And so, Lord, I give myself to Thee again, praying, Lord, that You would come and cleanse and fill and sanctify and use. We pray that there will be a sense of the presence of God in this house tonight. Lord, above, Lord, the voice of man, Above, Lord, this feeble preacher on this pulpit tonight, that we would be conscious that God is here, that you would grip this meeting tonight with eternity. No, God, we pray that it will propel us to live a life for thee in these last closing days of time. And so, Father, shut us in with thyself tonight. We pray that you'd remove every distraction, Lord. We pray that you'd remove every diversion from us. And, Lord, that the power of God would come and Lord, that the anointed would rest over this gathering tonight. We ask it in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen and amen. We're turning to the word of the Lord again tonight, this wonderful book of Revelation. And I'm a no scholar, I'm no prophetic preacher, but you have to start somewhere, don't you? And whenever we bring ourselves to this wonderful book of Revelation, it's the book that has the threefold blessing. It has a blessing to those that read it those that hear it, and those that keep it. This revelation is not just a revelation of things that are going to happen. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know, if there's a day in which we live today, we need to know more about the Lord Jesus than any other day. People have a conception in their mind of what he's like. People have a man-made conception of who Jesus is. But none of those things really matter. What we need to discover is what the Bible says what he's like. And that's why we're turning again to this wonderful book 
of Revelation. We're living in the last days. Even the ungodly man knows that today. You go into the Moy or into Dungannon and even the, the pauper on the street is, has an anticipation in his heart that something's going to happen. As we look at Israel and Iran and Russia, as we see the scene being set and the stage, as it were, being set, there seems to be something on the horizon. In these last days, the Apostle Paul said that they were going to be perilous times Dangerous times, dark times, demonic times. And that's where you and I are living tonight. Any moment now what was penned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is going to happen. It may be at morn, it may be at midnight, it may be at noon. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross and was laid in the grave, and on the third day he rose again. My dear people, he's coming to the air for his people. He will descend the, the, the slopes of heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. The one that we sing about, the one that we preach about, the one that we read about, how we were taken up this morning as we gathered around this table to think that we're going to see him. And maybe even before the end of this day, just like Enoch, taken up. Just like Elijah, taken up. Just like the Lord Jesus himself as he went out as far as Bethany and there he was taken up from his disciples. That's exactly what's going to happen to the blood-bought people of God. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, someone will be cleaning their teeth and he'll come again. Someone will be driving their car, he'll come again. Someone will be hugging their child and he'll come again. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I tell you that's a solemn that's a solemn thing. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, and we've been relating that over every Sunday night, the last three Sunday nights, if you're here and you're not saved, there comes that moment of a deadline. That moment whenever grace is gone forever. The opportunity to get saved is gone. And those that are saved will rise to meet the Lord in the air. And what a wonderful time and a wonderful event that will be. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 to see the Lamb in the midst of the throne. There will be a throne there, unlike any other throne. Above the throne of all the dignities of the world, there will be the Lamb in the midst of the throne. What a throne! What a throng! My multitude that cannot be numbered. What a theme! And we'll sing redeemed from every kindred and every tongue and every nation and every tribe. What a wonderful event that will be. I trust that you're going to be there. And while we will be in heaven, and while the church will be taken, things start to happen down in this old world that never happened before. A clock starts to tick. And we've been discovering night after night that there's something that is called in the Scriptures the wrath of God. We've forgotten about that. That there's coming a day that is called the day of wrath. And the Lord Jesus, the Lamb on the throne, he, he takes the book and he starts to open the seals and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they come out just like the, the bullets from a gun, one after another. There's the white horse, there's the red horse, there's the black horse, there's the pale green horse. One fourth of the world's population die. They can't bury them now, they'll be mass graves. The judgment of God is coming. And if you're not saved, it's too late. And there's the seven seals that are opened and we discovered how the kings of the earth and the rich men and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks and they asked the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. And they knew it had come. I wonder where they brought up on a mother's knee and they neglected and rejected the grace of God and now they're here. And then we discovered last Sunday night not only is there the seven seals, there's the seven trumpets. And one after another, the wrath of God comes upon this world in a very, very intense way. We discovered that there's going to be silence in heaven for half an hour. 
All of heaven is in shock. The angels stop their, their worshiping. The saints stop their singing. All of the noise of heaven comes to a standstill for 30 minutes as, as, as it were in surprise. Is God really going to do what he's going to do? And then the angels are dispatched one after another and they have the trumpet. There's the first trumpet, the second trumpet, and down through the seven trumpets, there's the wrath of God that is unleashed on this old world. And my dear people, tonight if you're saved, this is actually going to happen. And I trust it will drive us into the prayer meeting tomorrow night. I trust it will drive us to try and win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God, the first trumpet that has sounded, the scenery of this world changes. It's never going to be the same again. One third of the trees are burned with fire. All of the green grass in the world is burned with fire. No silage, no hay, no milk from the cows. The second one, the seas change. One third of the oceans turn to blood. Oh, one third of the fish all around the world die. One third of all the ships in the sea are destroyed. And, and God's going to change this whole world. This world that the Lord Jesus came to. And the Bible says he came unto his own. And his own received him not. And if you're here tonight, whether you're young or whether you're old, my dear people, God has given you the prerogative that you can accept him or you can reject him. But let me tell you this. There's always the consequences for a choice. Things are going to change. The ecosystems of this world are going to change. We saw how there's going to be a star that will fall from heaven called Wormwood. It's going to come across all of the fountains of the world. And my, the water is going to become bitter. And the Bible says he or she that drinks of it will die. They're talking about Loch Ness and green algae. Let me tell you, it's just a little foretaste of the wrath of God. Then the solar system changes. God starts to dim the light of heaven. And maybe you're here tonight and maybe you're saying as a believer, my, this is, this is fantastic. This seems, seems as it were too hard to believe. I was out walking the other day and I looked up at the sun and I looked over Loch Fay and I seen the trees and I started to talk to them. And you know what I said? You're actually going to see this. You're actually going to be here whenever I'm gone. And the ecosystems will change and the solar systems will change. The sun will be dimmed to one third. The moon will stop shining. One third of it will be darkened. One third of the stars will stop to shine. I tell you, they're talking about the northern lights. I wonder, is God getting people ready to look up? Look up at the stars. And some night you'll go out and you look up and one third of the sun will be blackened. One third of the stars won't be there. And the wrath of God is just starting to come now. The solar systems will change. Society will change. We saw how there's an angel coming, a, a fallen angel, a demonic power that is going to be let loose. He, he's coming and his name is Apollyon. The destroyer. He's got a key in his hand and he, he opens Revelation 9. It says he opens the bottomless pit. And as you and I are in this meeting tonight, there's a place that is called the bottomless pit. And in that bottomless pit, there's demonic powers that God, by his grace, in this age has changed. He's restraining them. From having their way, I can tell you the devil's doing a lot tonight. But he could do a lot more if the Lord let him. And there comes a day whenever this, this destroying angel, he puts the key in the door of the bottomless pit. And my, we read how the smoke ascends as the smoke of a furnace. And the light that is left from the sun is darkened. This is, this is a darkness now that you can feel. And out of the pit there come demonic powers, these locusts. We saw something about their terror. They have a face of a man. They've got hair like a woman. We saw something about their teeth. They've got teeth like a lion. Would you like to meet him down a dark alleyway, would you? This is not hell yet. 
This is just what God's going to let happen in this world. And if your son and daughter's not saved, and I was looking at Emily before, I went out to the meeting tonight and said, Oh God, don't, don't let her live and die without Christ. Get into the prayer meeting. We saw something about their terror. We saw something about their teeth. We saw something about their tails. They've got a tail like a scorpion. And they go to sting men, and their task is given for five months to hurt them, to torment them, to possess them. And there'll be worldwide demon possession. And men and women will do things that they never thought they would do. Did you see that woman the other day in the news? Killed her father and mother and has been living with them in the house for three or four years. You know what it is? It's demonic. That's what it is. I tell you, whenever you see a man and a woman, or a man and a man, flaunting sin before God, and you see the world today going after children and trying to kill them in the womb, and then trying to kill old people in an old people's home, you know what it is? It's demonic, and it's just a little foretaste of what's going to happen. And the power of God will let them loose, and they'll have their way for five months, and they'll hurt men, and they'll torment men, and men will seek death, and they'll not be able to find it. They'll look for a way out, but they can't get out. Now, can you think of anything worse? Can you think of anything worse being brought up in Northern Ireland and seeing verses on trees, hearing men in the open air, being in gospel services at weddings, at funerals, and my, your mother and father prayed for you, and now you've missed the rapture and you're left, and the wrath of God is coming, and you try to die and you can't die. God help you. I tell you, it's coming. As sure as the clothes are on your back, it's coming. As sure as the shoes are on your feet, it's coming. Society will change. It will never be the same again. The severity of God's judgment will change. Am I after these demonic powers are let loose? There's something else happens. Four principalities, you read it in Revelation 9, Four principalities that are bound in the river Euphrates are let loose and they have a demonic army of 200 million. And instead of hurting men, you know what the Bible says, it was given unto them power to kill men. And God let them loose, it says, for one year, one day, one month, and one hour. And they had the rule and the run of the world. And my dear people, let me tell you this, you talk about cat and mouse. And the demonic powers will be after individuals, I tell you. This is something of the wrath of God now. This is something of God letting men just have what they want. I was thinking today of what Winston Churchill said in 1942 in the, on the 10th of November. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. It is only the end of the beginning. There's still more to come. You you think of all the trees dead. You think of the lights being dimmed. You think of the water being poisoned. You you think of these demonic powers being let loose. You, You think of the man of sin being revealed. Can it get any worse? Yes, it can, and yes, it will. There's not only seven seals, there's seven trumpets, and then there's seven vials of the wrath of God. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 15 and verse number 1. And I saw another sign in heaven. He didn't imagine it. He saw it. Uh, Just like you see me tonight, and as I see you, this is something that John actually saw. I saw another sign in heaven, a great and marvelous, the word is a shocking, surprising thing. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. You see that wee word filled there? It's the same word that the Lord Jesus used on the cross when he cried, finished. It's the word teleo. It means to come to 
fulfillment. It means now that the wrath of God is coming in its, its completion. Look down to verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials or golden bowls, and they were full of the wrath of God. Not just a little bit of God's wrath. These are full of God's wrath. And maybe there's some people here tonight, and you know as believers you think you're going to go through the great tribulation. Let me tell you this. There's a difference between tribulation and great tribulation. Tribulation is the wrath of men. But the great tribulation is the wrath of God. I was talking to a boy not that long ago. And he said to me, you know, Stephen, I'm going to go out into the forest tomorrow. I said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to learn how to build a hut and eat berries because whenever I go into the great tribulation, I'm going to be well prepared. And he's storing up his beans and pasta and all of the rest of it. My dear people, that will not cut butter with God. The trees will be gone. The hiding places will be gone. This is not the wrath of men. This is the wrath of God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon upon the earth. You see these vials that are full of the wrath of God, they're going to be poured upon things. And they're not only going to be poured upon things, they're going to be poured upon people. This is the wrath of God unleashed, let loose, no limitations, no restrictions. Look at verse 2. And the first went, he was let loose. He went with his golden bowl, his golden vial, full of the wrath of God, and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and a grievous sore, listen to it, upon men. This is the wrath of God now that's coming upon men. You see, that neighbor that we, you live beside or that work friend that you work with that's not saved, and, and my, they, they start to know something of the wrath of God, and it's too late. I wonder, will they ask themselves the question, why did she never tell me? Why did he never tell me? You see this, a noisome and a grievous sore, the word is here. Oh, I can tell you, I can't even really begin to describe it to you tonight. It means a weeping, malignant ulcer. It means a painful, cancerous sore. Something that is weeping and is always weeping. Something that is always an open wound and it turns cancerous. And this is from God upon man. Look at the rest of the verse, verse 2. A noisome and a grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. You see, whenever the church goes, and it will go, there's someone going to be revealed. The man in Revelation chapter 6, who's going to come out on a white horse, and he's going to have a bow in his hand, and he's going to come to conquer. And he's going to come with peace, and he'll sort out the Middle East. Ah, but he's called the beast. The man of sin, that wicked one, the son of perdition. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to make every individual take his mark. Come on back with me just a little moment to chapter 13. Chapter 13 and verse 16. Just to see what this mark is going to be. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16 and he causeth all, just mark that little word now, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their forehead. All of the people, the church are not there. Don't talk to me about that. Don't tell me that God's going to pour his wrath upon his people, a load of nonsense. I tell you, the, the beast will cause all small, great, rich, poor, free, bond to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads. This is the mark of the beast that's coming. Look at verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his number. In the end of the verse, of verse 18, it says, and his number 
is a number 600, three score and six, 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 six. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're not saved, whenever you go home, look in the mirror and put your hand on your forehead and ask yourself the question, if you reject Christ any longer and go through this world and you reject the Son of God and do despite to the grace of God, put your hand on your forehead before you get into bed tonight and ask yourself the question, will it be there? Or put your hand on your right hand and say, will he put it there? You see, without this mark, there'll be no freedom. There'll be no ability to buy. I tell you, there'll be no ability to go to the shop. Tesco's is out of the question. Fuel is out of the question. Buying kettle is out of the question. Everything just comes to a stop. There was a man who gave his testimony on the internet a number of years ago. He was approached by the American government. He was a scientist, a technological scientist. And they asked him to make a chip one quarter the size of a grain of rice. He set to the work and he, he made it. It had to be able to transmit information by a radio beam. They told him that it had to have a lithium battery in it, no other type, only a lithium battery. It had to have a little circuit in it that was able to recharge. And whenever he went to work, he discovered that he needed somewhere in the body that would heat up and cool down and heat up and cool down more rapidly than any other part of the body because that's what the little device uses to recharge itself. The American government sent out my uh, a task force and they went through the nation and asked questions and done the research. As far as I know, there is over $2 million that was spent on that research. The information come back that the best place and the only place in the body that uh, spikes so high and drops so low is such an irregular temperature as the forehead or the right hand. The American government told him whenever he was making it, listen to it whenever you go home, by no means was he to read the book of Revelation. And after he made it, and he made the little chip one-fourth one quarter smaller than a grain of rice. He did read the book of Revelation and he got saved. Thank God for that. He asked a scientist shortly after it, let me ask you this, he said, what happens if a lithium battery bursts inside the human body? Well, what happens if that little device that I made ruptures and that lithium gets out? And the scientist said this, it will bring a weeping, painful, ulcerous, cancerous sore, and he didn't know anything about the Bible. God's a step ahead, you know. I tell you, my dear people, I'm not trying to scare you tonight, but all I'm trying to tell you tonight, this is in the Word of God. This is not man's imagination. This is not doctrine from the lifeboat. This is the Bible. This is the Word of the living God, and I happen to believe it with all of my heart. I tell you, my dear people, the reason I'm preaching this tonight is to tell you that you're not too far gone yet, hallelujah, that there's still hope, that there's still an answer, that there's still such a thing as the grace of God, hallelujah. Oh, I can tell you there's going to be, there's going to be cancer, cancerous sores that will come upon men. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm out for the night because I've got two babies and I'm not going to go home until they're fed. But let me give you a few more and you'll be able to read it whenever you go home. Because I can tell you this is only the first file. This is only the, the start of the end of the, oh, of the wrath of God. This is only the start of it now. This is not some man hitting a nuclear button. This is God giving the world over. And if you play with God any longer, he might just give you over. Go on ahead and we'll look at another one. You see, there's not only going to be cancer upon men. Look at verse number 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. You know, we got a dog the year that we got married. And he got knocked down two days after the twins were born. The car came down the road and knocked him down. Couldn't believe it. I set him behind the hedge and... 
I went and I dug a hole, and whether it's right or wrong, I made a cross even for his grave. There's something for you. But you know, whenever I went back to that dog, you know what had happened to his blood? It had all congealed. Started to clot. And whenever this angel comes and he pours the wrath of God upon the sea, it all congeals now. This is the wrath of God. There'll be no migrant boats coming across the British Isles that day. There'll be none of you men going down to the coast to get away from your wife that day. This is the wrath of God coming upon the seas now. And the whole thing just congeals like the blood of a dead man. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Look at verse 8 and verse 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch man with fire, and men were scorched with a great heat and blasphemed the name of God. Talk about global warming. Way back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, it says the sun shall be seven times hotter. I wonder is God going to do that because of old ungodly Nebuchadnezzar did that with the children of God. And men will be blistered and men will be burned. And as a result of that, they'll blaspheme the God of heaven. These are the vials of the wrath of God. Factor 50 is no good now. There's no trees to hide under. There's no clouds in the sky. God dimmed the lights and now he just turns them up seven times hotter and the cancerous sore starts to weep. And my, the seas are congealed like blood and the snail and the, the, my, the stench that starts to enter into the nostrils of humanity that have rejected the Son of God. And you can't even die. Look at verse number 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, or the throne of the man of sin. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they chewed their tongue for pain. I tell you, my dear unsaved, let me tell you this, that not only put your hand on your forehead before you get into bed tonight, and put your left hand over your right hand, and say, is it going to be there? Put your hand into your mouth. And get a hold of your tongue. That tongue that told lies. And that tongue that maybe has used God's name as a curse word. That tongue that God gave you to glorify him. And you've used it to defy him for so long. I wonder will you chew it. Like a piece of gum. And this is the wrath of God. I tell you I have never seen anyone chew their tongue in pain. I have never seen that. I can't explain that to you tonight. But to be in so much agony and you're not even in hell yet and you would take the tongue between your teeth and you would chew it to distract you, to take something of the pain away and you discover that gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is now pouring his unhindered wrath out. God help us. Look at verse 17, do you see? Because there's not only going to be cancer upon men, and there's not only going to be the congealing of the sea, and there's not only going to be the catastrophe in the sky and the chewing of the mouth, there's going to be the crushing of the nations. Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there was voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as what was not since man was upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. You know what God's going to do? He's just going to shake the whole thing. He's going to shake every throne. He's going to shake every kingdom and everything that can be shaken shall be shaken. Look at verse 19. And the great city Jerusalem was divided in three parts. And the cities of the nation fell. Belfast, I can tell you, will be just shaken into rubble. London will be just shaken into rubble. All of the great metropolises of the world, the wrath of God is let loose, and he just uses an old-time-fashioned earthquake to bring men down into the dust. Look at it again. And the great Babylon came into the remembrance before God, and gave unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. I wonder, will Ireland, I wonder where Ireland will be. 
I wonder where Rathlin will be. I wonder where the Isle of Man will be. Whenever God starts to shake it, and every island fled away, and the mountains, the moorns will be gone, the sparrows will be gone, and were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. You know how heavy a talent is? A talent is 250 kilograms. One bag of sugar is one kilogram. Imagine dropping that from heaven. Imagine a block of ice coming from heaven, 250 kg. That's a quarter of a ton. And God now just starts to drop, not even missiles, not even nuclear weapons. He just uses old-time fashioned ice. Imagine you were sitting in your house and you've got the mark of the beast on your head and the weeping cancerous ulcer sore. And you're trying to get a little bit of coverage from the sun. And my, it's there and it's blazing seven times hotter. My, everything's bleak. Everything's desolate. The sea is congealed. The scenery's changed. The solar system's changed. Society has changed. The demons are after you. And you think you've got a bit of respite. And then there's a block of ice, 250 kilograms, comes down through the roof. I tell you, you wouldn't believe it. John wrote all of this in the Isle of Patmos. My dear people, all I'm trying to say to you tonight, if you leave it to here, it's too late. If you leave it to this day, all hope is gone forever. And that's why tonight as I close this meeting, I want to tell you about a man. I want to bring you to tonight the Lamb upon the throne that was the Lamb upon the cross. I tell you, my dear people, the Bible says that he came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. I tell you, he came into the matrix of a virgin's womb. He lived for 33 years. He lived for 30 years down in Nazareth in the carpenter's workshop. And then he entered his ministry, and I tell you, he preached he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the multitude. Oh, I tell you, he done all of those wonderful miracles. But I'm glad tonight that he died for me upon the cross. Hallelujah. I'm glad tonight that there's still hope. I'm glad tonight that the devil hasn't got it all his own way. I'm glad tonight at this moment that there's a man on the throne and he's in control. Hallelujah. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, and rivers of pleasure I see. I'll never endure the wrath of God. You know why? There was someone took my place. Ah, Stephen Riddle the liar, yes. Stephen Riddle the, the blasphemer, yes. Stephen Riddle, uh, the drunkard, and into drugs and fighting. I tell you, couldn't tell the truth if he was paid. But there came a man, the Son of God, and he died on the cross for me, and he shed his precious blood. And there came a day in my life whenever all I did was I owned my guilt, I owned my shame, and I came to the Lord Jesus and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Will you come into my heart and will you save me? And I can tell you he saved me and he has kept me and he has blessed me more than tongue can ever tell. Hallelujah. Oh, my dear people, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And whenever the wrath comes and whenever the blocks of ice come and whenever the sun is turned up and whenever the sea is turned to blood, I'll not be here because he's coming back for me. Oh, because not only did he die. That's not the gospel, you know. I tell you, the gospel's not about a dead Savior. On the third day, he rose again. And he defeated death and hell and sin in the grave. And my dear people tonight, he's the one that can save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day, and if he comes tonight, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go tonight. I'm anchored in Jesus.
Oh, that's it. What about you tonight? Honestly now. God's talking to you. I'm not here to lecture you on things that are going to happen in eternity to come. I'm here to ask you, dear, where are you going to go? What happens if he comes back tonight and you go into your parents' bedroom and they're not there? What are you going to do? You going to come to the lifeboat? I'll not be here. Bertie will not be here. The elders will not be here. And all hope's gone forever because you lingered too long. I tell you, we need the fear of God back again. This is not Mickey Mouse. This is real. You know what happens after that? You stand before the one that you rejected. And the great white throne judgment and heaven and earth are rolled up like a scroll. And John said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, the hymn books, the Bible, all of the books of your deed. And, and my, the Bible says, my, those that were not found written in the book of life were, were cast into the lake of fire where the devil is, where the beast is, where the false prophet is, where they're tormented in the fire and brimstone forever and ever and ever and ever. And before you tonight in a lost sinner's hell, Stands, stands a risen Savior with the marks of the nails in his hands. And the question would come to you as I close now and we sing a hymn. As it came from the lips of Pilate of old. What shall I do then with Jesus? Which is called Christ. Neutral I cannot be. Someday the, I'll ask the question. What will he do with me? What's he going to do? Are you going to accept him to me? Are you going to repent? Or are you going to say, I'm going to take my chance? And the wrath of God to come. Would you not come with us to heaven? Oh, come with us to the land that is fairer than day. And by faith I can see it afar where the Father watches over the way and prepares us a dwelling place there. We're going to rise to our feet and we're going to sing 575, 575 in the hymn book. And if you're saved tonight, I want you to enjoy and sing this hymn with all of your heart. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. Oh, I wonder will we all be there from the meeting tonight. I wonder will we all be there on this side, on this side, all from the youngest until the oldest. I wonder are you going to be there Well, when the roll is called up yonder. My, I wonder will you be missing. Let us rise to our feet, five, seven, five, and if you're saved tonight and you know that your sins are under the blood and you've got your faith in Christ tonight and you know that you're a child of God, my, I want you to pull out all the stops tonight. The world can sing their songs, but I tell you, the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing tonight. I want you to enjoy it and let us praise the Lord with all of our heart. And if you're not saved tonight, well, you get saved even as we stand to our feet. We'll go to your home. There's a little room at the door, but don't go through this life and reject Christ and die at the end of it all and endure the wrath of God. Let us rise to our feet tonight and praise the Lord and may the Lord bless us this evening. I want you to sing it. Sing it unto the Lord tonight. Sing it with all of your heart. Let the man and the gentleman hear us tonight. Okay.
Are you singing that from your heart? When we all get to heaven, are you ready to go? My dear people, I'm just going to linger this meeting just a little longer. And we're going to sing verse 3 and verse 4 again. Because the devil could just try to distract you now. And you could make a decision that would damn your soul for eternity. Verse 3 and verse 4. Every believer singing and praying. Okay.